to pray about the sixth hour. He became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him. Is it had been a great sheep knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, three times. And the vessel was then received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision, which he had seen, should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless your word this morning. Help our hearts and our minds to be open and receptive. Help our ears to be clear to hear. Lord, may there be nothing happen that would take our thoughts away from the words of this message this morning. Help our people to be able to understand what I'm going to preach. It would be easy to walk out of here this morning and and not fully understand some of the things I'm about to say. But I ask, Lord, that you be as you always have. And by the Holy Spirit, make your word clear and understandable. That we ask humbly in Jesus' name. Cover me with your blood, Jesus. Make me worthy to be your servant today. In your holy, righteous name we pray. Amen. Over the period of these three messages, I have shared with you some things that the Lord revealed to me in a vision back in February. Five hours long during the night. Most of those things we have preached and exhausted in the first two messages. Where do we go from here? We talked about how to get back to repentance. How to once again find the Holy Spirit as He really is. Tongues has been misrepresented. We thank the Lord for tongues, interpretation, and all the nine gifts of the Spirit. But over the years, we have tried to place the Holy Spirit under certain situations. And if those situations, situations don't arise, and the Holy Spirit wasn't present. We all know that is not truth. We know the Bible says where two or three are gathered together in the name of Jesus, there He is in the midst. And where Jesus is, there the Holy Spirit is. How many understands that? So, we talked about how to come back to the church. How the church also has been misrepresented. It's a place where we can run when we are in trouble. Yes, I agree. It's a place where we can find friendship. It should be that way. But the church is more than that. A church is a place where God's people come together and worship Him in spirit and in truth. The church is where people invite the presence of God into their midst. And there God takes control of everything that's going on. And we come in with problems and leave, leaving those problems at the altar. The church becomes a haven, an umbrella, if you will, for people to get under when the world is so vehement and so dangerous. We can come to the church and find a place of safety, a place where they can't get us, but yet God can. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Such a wonderful thing. Then we talked about the place of healings. How that the world today needs healed. 
But yet people don't quite understand. They look at people instead of God. Many times people's names, like evangelists, become our faith. Instead of our faith being what the Word of God said it ought to be. We appreciate all the great evangelists. And all the great pastors who preach healing. But they'd have nothing going on in their services if it was not for the place of meetings. If it was not going back to the cross and realizing that by His stripes we are healed by soul and spirit. So, where do we come today? How do you feel about your church, ladies and gentlemen? I'm going to thank you for turning in your vision. Uh, and you that may not have done that, we handed out in the bulletins little sheets of paper as well as I was not here. And you had an opportunity to write down your vision for this church. I trust that you took opportunity to do that. And if you haven't, please fill yours out and turn it in to me. And it will be confidential. How do you feel about your church and how do you see God's plan unfolding in the future of this church? We all sometimes idealize things concerning, pardon me, things concerning the church. And, and we formulate in our minds or preconceive the way things ought to be or the way things should not be. And by uh, allowing these things to be preconceived, we make the church what we want it to be instead of what God wants it to be. And many times, these preconceived ideas, although meant well, are off track. Very much so. Today, what do you envision for the future of this church? Heard somebody say not long ago, thank God they didn't attend this church. So it's going to get harder for churches, and preacher, you better get ready because your church isn't going to mount to a hill of beans. I turned to him and it made me mad, I got to admit. Although God's dealt with my temper quite quite good lately. I turned to him and I counted to ten. And that's what I tell everybody else to do. And then I said, Sir, my Bible tells me the gates of hell shall not prevail Amen. against his church. Amen. So no matter whether I'm here or I'm not here. Whether any of us are here, that are here presently today, God's church will still go. Amen. How many believe that? So I've asked you to cast your vision, as I've asked God to help me do myself. When talking about vision, I'm reminded of McDonald's. And I, I like their chicken sandwiches. Uh, I recommend that you get the one that's a little more expensive. It's not that ground up stuff. So it has all the solid meat in it. And I like the french fries, although I'll cut back on them. But I like the great crop. The founder of McDonald's had to say about his company. As you take a closer look at the gold marches, we hope you understand why we feel good about being a company whose vision includes the world should be a better place because of McDonald's. We want you to see why we're proud of the contributions that we have made to improve our communities, our hometowns, and around the world. I have sort of revamped that a little bit, and I'd like to state it this way. As you take a closer look at Mount Morris Gospel Tabernacle, I hope you understand why we feel good about being a church whose vision includes the world should be a better place because of Jesus Christ. We want you to see why we're proud of the contributions that we have made to improve our community, our hometown, and also around the world. I think vision is very important today. And having said that, I believe that many voices cry for our attention today. But only one counts. Simon Peter was on a rooftop when a voice suddenly began to speak to him. 
And in a trance or a vision, as he fell asleep, he was waiting on dinner. He was very, very hungry, very weak. Have you ever got hungry and nervous? Because I mean, nervous and weak because you were very, very hungry. Uh, when it gets that way, you just gotta have something. The other day that happened to me, and I snuck in. Uh, Rose was gonna make dinner, but she was downstairs at the at the washer, so I I took a whole tube of crackers and I crammed them down my throat. <laughs> a whole tube. And I was done before she got up there. <laughs> I was just so hungry I couldn't make it. I felt that I couldn't. Well, he was very, very hungry. And so he went up to the rooftop to pray and to wait on those who were preparing dinner. In doing so, he fell asleep. And the trance of a vision, the Lord directed him to go to Cornelius' house. Now, all this was coming to play because in the meantime, God had already spoken to Cornelius and told him that he needed to come and send messengers to Peter. And that Peter was to come to his house because he wanted more from God than he had. And, uh, you know, this was something for Peter because Cornelius was a centurion, a Roman soldier or a Roman officer of all things. This was a big thing for Peter. He was a traditional Jew, believe it or not, who believed strictly in the Old Testament and in the Old Testament law. Even though he was saved, and even after he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was still very, very faithful to the Mosaic Law. And he went to the temple regularly, just as everyone else did. You remember when him and John was off walking up to the temple to pray, when all the rest of the Jews were gathering, and this man put his cup out and said, Alms, alms. Peter had been filled with the Holy Spirit, and he turned. And he said, Sir, the Bible says he looked in him in the eye. And he said, Sir, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And that day that man rose up for the first time in 38 years. And ran into the temple with them, praising God and giving glory to the Lord. I believe today, this was a big thing for Peter. And I want to show you this morning how God was about to change his mind and his ministry. And you know, folks, as years go by, our ministry changes. Our churches change. It, it's the same with everything. God changes. God seen God change my ministry. And if I was, if I was to be the same as I was when I began, began the ministry, I'd be standing up here preaching out of the out of those uh, daily bread books. How many of you ever got those? Those prayer books? I didn't know what it was to seek for a sermon. So I'd just go through that prayer book until I exhausted it. And I would pick out one, one page there for October 31st. And I would preach on that scripture. It would save me time. I didn't have to search out the Bible. I didn't know how to preach anyway. I still don't. But I, I went to that prayer book. That was the whole thing I did. I don't think you'd last long here if I preached out of the prayer book. But you see, we change. God changes our ministry. As we go along, everything changes, whether in the church or in how we minister to others. I want to share with you two things this morning. First of all, there are the voices that Peter heard. First, there is the voice of tradition. I'm not against tradition. I just think that we have to be careful that we don't allow tradition to kill everything we try to do. Amen. I believe Paul said, follow those things which I have taught you in tradition. But even Paul's ministry changed from the time that he started until he went up and his head was cut off for the name of Jesus' sake. There are voices. First, the voice of tradition. Don't eat those wild things. Don't eat those snakes. In that seat, the Bible says there were reptiles. There were hogs. You know what Israel felt in the Mosaic Law about eating pork. You shouldn't do it. There was all types of cattle. Probably all types of wild animals. Deer. Coon. And I won't get into that. I've ate coon. Anybody else? I've ate everything but possible. 
I, I refuse to eat that. It's got a tail like a rat. <laughs> I will eat it. But when we were young growing up, we lived on groundhog. Anybody ever eat groundhog? It isn't the tastiest, but it'll keep you alive. Thank you. Tradition. Don't eat those wild things. God, I can't go to the Gentiles. Listen to me this morning, church. If God had not got through to Peter, Gospel Tabernacle would not be here today. Because the message that Jesus died for, he sent that message to the Jewish nation. It was after Jesus went back to heaven that the Holy Spirit began to deal with the apostles. First with Peter, and then with Paul, who was first called Saul. Especially these two men were, were the ones who laid out the pathway for the gospel to leave the Jewish nation and Jerusalem and go to the uttermost parts of the world. It was interesting. The other day I was listening to a historical station on TV. And somewhere in England, this castle was built. And history, the history of that area tells us that that castle was 2,500 years old. Now that's hard to find. No wonder Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28, 19, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them as he taught us. Listen to me. While Jesus was born and reared in Nazareth, and then preached and died on the cross in Jerusalem, there was a castle that was already built in what we know to be England. That's interesting. And uh, I said that basically to say this. Peter probably heard a voice saying, this has never been done this way before. Dan May wrote, he liked things the way they were, Simon Peter. He probably thought they'd better stick with the way things were. He may have heard the voice of what will my peers think. I believe Peter was thinking, if I kill and eat these things, what will all my good Jewish friends think of me? Let alone breaking the law of Moses. <coughs> On the rooftop, Simon probably heard the voice, let's maintain the status quo. We don't need a new vision from God. We don't need a fresh start. Everything's in place. So we'll just stick here and sit here until God pours out His presence. We've been sitting too long waiting for Him to pour out His presence. We're wearing out pews waiting for Him to pour out His presence. When God is saying, I've got a vision for you. And when you begin to do it, when that begins to happen, I believe the word went on to Peter to say, listen, Peter, don't get stirred up. Don't get excited. There's no need to get, to get uh, excited about this thing. There's no need for us to be changed or supercharged by the power of God. Just relax. H.B. London said, he just spoke for us in our district council, I believe. I could not be there. Bringing about genuine and lasting religious transformation requires leadership that is more aggressive than simply constructing bigger buildings, replacing the overhead projector with a big screen projector system, and introducing a few new programs. I am not a church growth expert, he says. I do not give a lot of space to that subject, but I am an observer. And I'm going to give you ten things that I have observed. Let me just read them quickly to you. Number one, the signs of a healthy church. Number one, that church is in unity. But it is not bogged down with uniformity. Amen. Amen. You see, folks, there can be unity in the church, 
But God can still do a new thing. Yes. How many understands what I'm saying? Yes. Secondly, they know their strength and their weaknesses. And a healthy church don't attempt to do something or be something that they are not. Thirdly, healthy churches are not clones of any other church or any other program. But have discovered what God wants for their church. And they do it in their context. Number four, a healthy church means that a pastor is committed to longevity, five to seven years minimum, and has a shepherd's heart. A healthy church is physically responsible, unimpressed with material things or images. A healthy church, they have a vision beyond their property line, and they're not afraid to step out beyond that property line and do something for Jesus. A healthy church, they deal with contention in a predetermined manner. I've heard before and I've known pastors. Every time somebody comes against them, they feel like somebody slapped them in the face and they go and soft for two or three months and don't speak to half the congregation. God help us. We can deal with contention in the church in an adult manner and still get on with God's business. Worship is spirited, yet pleasant and well presented. Attendees are not simply pew fillers, but they are cared for and then are engaged in ministry. Yeah. That's something we're working hard to get done here that we have not fully accomplished. And number 10, a healthy church. They are relevant to the culture. You hear this? They are relevant to the culture and focused on biblical teaching and holy living among a culture that needs to hear about God's holiness. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of some things that lately that we're either half or pulling out of the sheep. I believe at Mount Morris, God has let that sheep down. And there are some of us in this church that may say, I will not partake of that. We've never touched that before. We've never done that before. But God is saying it's time you begin. Let me share it with you without shocking you too badly. Not long ago, about a week ago, we hosted the election polls in our church basement. I have heard controversy and I've heard people praise it. We didn't go to them, they came to us. We never went over and said, hey, we'd love to do the elections. But nobody else would do it. So they came to us. And when they gave, we gave them a remote corner of our basement. And I was standing behind two people and they didn't know I was behind them when I was voting. And they said, why do we have to come to this church? I swore I'd never step in this church. Why did we go to a public place? I don't know. All I know is we went out beyond our living. And if the church doesn't start doing that, then we're not going to reach the loss. It's called vision. Something else, this is going to shock you. We're going to start being on the radio pretty soon. One and a half hours, one service. One and a half hour long. You say, well, I bet you had to hunt a lot for that, didn't you, Pastor? They came to us. We didn't go to them. The owner of the radio stations came to me and said, I had moved churches out of that time spot and put them on AM. I felt bad about that. So that we could put your church on Sunday morning from 10.30 to 12 noon. Wow. Here's the thing that blew my mind. I said, wait a minute, because he told me, he said, we're going we're gonna to take the services and put your whole service on the radio. Just as it is. I said, wait a minute. I said, we're Pentecostal. I know you're Pentecostal. I said, there may be times when people speak in an unknown tongue. He said, I want, I want people to hear that. 
He says, there's none of that on our radio station, and I want people to hear what church is really all about. I was a bit upset with the charge, and we haven't presented that to you yet, but we do one thing at a time. First, you started out with $280 a week. I said, that's too much. Two months later, he comes back and he says, it's still empty. I haven't let anybody fill it. He's been playing music and keeping that. This is a worldly station. This is a country music station. Guess how many unsaved people are going to get to hear the gospel? Finally got it down to 175. I couldn't get him any lower. And the board and us agreed, let's go for it. We're finishing up the basement downstairs. You know how on original plans we say we're going to do this or that or the other? But God gave us a bit of a vision. There's an area that could house about four classrooms. And if we close that and cut it up into four classrooms, we could never do anything else with it. So we decided to put a sliding petition in that area. You see that we're building down there. And make at least two areas in it. And possibly we could put an extra sliding petition the other way. And here's what we'd like to do. Instead of just having four more classrooms and then not being big enough, Joyce and Keith Anderson's class right now is running over 30 people. I know that Barb Morris has a powerful class. I don't know about all the other classes. But this area can be used for Sunday school class or classes. Then it can be used for the large children's church, which is running up to 50 kids, and we have no room for them. Then it can be used for the youth group. They're going to change and have our youth services on Wednesday night so that our youth can come to Sunday night service. And yet they'll get to have their own youth area and do whatever they want to with that area. How many can say amen? amen? You see, it's versatile. It's not what you plan, but I believe it's what God wants done. Yes. And in doing so, we'll be able to minister to many, many areas of the church. Are you with me this morning? Yes. I don't expect you to agree with everything I'm saying, but at least pray about it. Because I believe God has given us a vision for this church. And I'll tell you, I may be getting sick now and then. And I may be in my 60s, but I'm not done yet. Yeah. I'm not done yet. <laughs> Young man's here this morning, I probably will shock him because I didn't tell him I was going to do this. But in September, we've invited a singing group, a Christian singing group. To come. Now these kids, you know, I'm old. And you get one of those guitars and go, Wee! you know, like that. Uh, acoustic? Is that the acoustic guitar? Electric guitar. And I'm not sure how high they get, but you know, we need to do something in our church to get the town's kids in here. So we dedicated a night, a night with the stand-up song. That's all I asked you to do. Here's one of the, here's one of the uh, singers. Right here. We've invited this this contemporary Christian group to come and dedicated a whole week to ministering in song to the kids in this area. I hope to God we get a bunch of them saved. How many can say it? Because if them saved, we'll bring mom and dad and fill the church. Yes. You see, these things have been taken out of that sheep that came down to Peter. Sometimes we tremble, we preachers, when we reach into that sheep and we're afraid to bring it out and do something with it because it's something different. But I pray God's blessing will be upon everything we're going to do. We 
will not forget, Lord, that it's not us that's doing this. It's not just our vision, either. But it's your vision. It's something that excites our spirit and lets us know that you're not done with us yet. But that there's some great things going to happen in Gospel Tabernacle. So Lord, we promise in our hearts that we're going to serve you to the best of our ability. And we will allow God and Jesus Christ to minister through us and to keep this church a lighthouse for the lost and the dying. My people, the Lord would have all of you know, it's not that the name of this church is that important, but it's that the name of Jesus is lifted up and glorified. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You see, God's voice today said to Peter, I've got a new work for you to do. You must accomplish it. I want you to rise and kill and eat. And I must get done here. How many are with me? I'm going to get done in just a little bit. I must arise and kill and eat. Peter's answer was, no more. What you are asking me today to do is defiling and unlawful and ungodly. But God said, what I have cleansed, let no man call common or unclean. Now, number two. First of all, we dealt with the voices that Peter heard. Now, there is a voice that really matters. And, and you know what that is. It's the voice of God. I want you to do my work, God says. And I want you to do it my way. I want you to go talk to a Roman. Now, that was unheard of. This, this was actually breaking sacrament for Peter to leave the law of Moses and the church of Jerusalem and go to a centurion, a Roman, part of the nation that was responsible for supplying the cross to put Jesus on. Should not be. I'm sure there was an uprising. Peter's answer was, I don't know, Lord. I don't know. Thomas Trask said this. This is our general superintendent of the Assemblies of God. Six characteristics of a transformational church. That means a church that's willing to transform into what God wants. Number one, a transformal ch transformational church is a disciplined church. This discipleship involves, uh, pardon me, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, discipleship involves diligent and intentional teaching and practices that promote a lifelong lifestyle of becoming ever more like Jesus and producing the Christ life in others. Number two, a transformational church encourages and promotes worship and powerful prayer. Number three, a transformational church is an evangel evangelizing church. A New Testament church will be a growing church that is reaching the spiritually lost and will support world evangelism. Number four, a transformational church multiplies itself through church planning or helping others to do so. Number five, a transformational church is a compassionate church, giving sacrificially to meet the physical and spiritual needs of people. And sixthly, a transformational church devotes itself to fellowship and to the breaking of bread together in worshiping and lifting up Jesus as the head of the church. You see... It's the voice of God. I want you to do my work, my way. Though many voices are crying out, we may hear God's voice say, Do it my way. Accomplish it my way. If you do it my way, I'll bless it. I'll honor it. I'll cause my anointing to fall upon it. I'll cause my glory to surround it and my power to back it up. May we also hear His voice say, Go the way I choose for you. You see, Simon Peter could have come down off that roof, enjoyed a good meal, and returned back to the comfort of Jerusalem, ministering to the Jewish people, and telling them more about Jesus, and His crucifixion, and His resurrection. No, thank God. When the brethren came to his gate and said, Cornelius sent us to you, we want you to come with us, because he's hungry for more of God. Peter left, and went. And through it, we Gentiles are now saved. 
and grafted into the vine. You see, Jonah knew what to do. And at first he didn't do it. And he went through an awful time in the belly of that whale. Back then they didn't have they didn't have the purple pill. Well, I imagine he had a time with stomach acid. But I tell you, when he was vomiting out on that beach, he was ready to preach. He was ready to preach. God has a way of persuading us. How many knows? How about the prophet Elijah? God told Elijah, He said, I want you to get, I want you to deal with Ahab and his wife Jeze, Jezebel. I want you to deal with these two people. They're ungodly, and you're the prophet in charge. But you know, he got to thinking because Jezebel looked out the window and said, if you don't get out of here, said, I'm going to feed your flesh to the dogs. Boy, that put fear in his, in his heart, and he turned, and, and he ran to the mountains and to the desert. There the ravens fed him, he kept him alive. Water was put there beside him. And all of a sudden, he woke up and he saw the, the, a power of wind go across the mountains. And it, it ripped the rocks off the top of the mountains. And the fire flew off of the top of the mountains. And it was just like a great earthquake. And all of a sudden, God came to him and said, listen, open up that ear of you. He says, I was not in the wind. I wasn't in the fire. I wasn't in the earthquake. But I'm in that still, small voice. How many hears that voice every day that directs us? That's the instigation of vision. I close with this. My last page, just a few words on it. You see, many voices are speaking to us in the church today. But only one voice counts. Let me tell you, if you're taking notes this morning, how vision comes about. Very simple. God takes us from where we are to where we want to go. That's vision. He implants it in our heart, puts it in our mind, puts it in our eyesight. Every time we close our eyes, we see it. Every time we get down to pray, we think about it. That's vision. God takes us from where we are to where we want to go. And I close with this. Dan Betzer. How many years ago on the radio? Has anybody heard of Dan Betzer? Somebody's of God evangelist on the radio. He's building a new church. Now, you know, I, I, I thank God for what we have here, but he says he's building a new church over five years that'll cost $20 million. But then he's got a congregation that runs about 5000 he says, I asked God, I said, God, I'm getting too old for this. I don't want to get into this. I'll probably die before the thing's done. God says, you build it. And then God gave him a vision. And he said this to him. He said, every block that you lay, every cup of water that you stir, you're doing for the next generation. You're not doing it for you. You're doing it for the next generation. How many believe there's a, if Jesus carries, there's another generation coming in? That generation has got to be taken care of. Souls must continue to get saved. Amen. People must continue, families must continue to find the church to be that umbrella of safety and of peace. How can they have it if we don't build it for them? Amen? Amen. If we don't provide it, we don't need that. Maybe we don't need that. But the next generation will. You see? Do you understand what we're saying? So this is it. I'm done. It's right here where I'm at on this last page. <laughs> We've cast our vision. We've cast our vision. I shared with you my heart. I've been open with you. You seem to be pretty receptive. So far to what I've told you. How do you believe in your heart with all the things that are wrong with the church? And if you want to find things that are wrong, we can, let, we can write a long list of them. 
But with all those things, how many believe God has something big to come our way? Would you stand? Praise the Lord. Let's get it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just pray God will let me live long enough to see some of the things that He has planted in my heart. I have a vision that He's given me that we have no more property, so we can't build any bigger than we are. But we'll have to go to two Sunday morning services to be able to house all the people. That's the vision the Lord's given me. I'd love to live long enough to be able to see that. And be able to see the Lord bring people in here from all over Mount Morris. He made this promise to me 26 years, almost 26 years ago, when I came here to preach for the very first time, October 25th. He says, you're going to win Mount Morris. You're going to win Mount Morris. I don't know about the rest of the towns, but I'm not responsible for the whole area. I'm only responsible for my own constituency. And I'm looking for the day when families will pour in here. And they are. We're getting families from Mount Morris and all over the place, from everywhere. And I want to see this town city. That's my vision. That's my vision. So this morning, as we close, would you bow your heads with me, please? First of all, you say, Pastor, how do I become a part of this vision? How do I become a part of this vision? The first thing you have to do if you're not saved is to say, Lord, I'm unsaved. I haven't asked you into my heart. I haven't asked you to fill my life with your, with your presence and to wash me in your blood. This morning, I want you to forgive me of all my sins. If you're here this morning and you want to be a part of the vision in this church, and yet you feel like God needs to do a work in your heart, just slip your hand up and put it in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see those hands. Any more? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any others? I want to be sure I'm saved, Pastor. I want to be sure I'm like with Jesus. We're going to pray about this right now. And in fact, I feel what I'd like for you to do. I need to get this second prayer in. I want you to reach across the aisle. Just move out. I want everybody holding hands all the way across the church. Just get across and make a solid line through every pew, every aisle. Reach out. If you have to, just get back there and get a hold of somebody's hand so that you're sure to be holding hands with somebody else. Up in the balcony, do the same. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, we're going to pray. Several hands were raised. I want to be ready, Jesus. I want you to forgive me of my sins and make me a new creature. And then I'm going to pray God's vision upon this church. I think I got one more sermon yet. I thought this third one was the last one, but I may hit you with one more next Sunday morning. Whatever God wants. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior and our King. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we, we admit that we're sinners. We admit that we're undone without God. And that, Lord, the only way we can be part of this vision is to be born again by the power of God. Save us from our sin right now. We confess you as our personal Savior. And we ask you to minister to us and keep us in your hands. Anoint us, Lord. Now, Lord, I pray for this congregation. Lord, I believe this morning, it sounded to me, maybe I'm wrong, but it sounded to me like, for the biggest part, they were with me. But Lord, we're ready to take in some new vision. We're ready to reach into that cloth that you were laying down. No matter what the, what some of the traditionalists would say, it's not of God. It shouldn't be done. But God, when you speak, we got to listen. We've got to follow you. Help us to pick up the vision and go with it. Let this church move ahead in power and in authority in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Minister to every family here. Help them with your blood. Save us and fill us with the Spirit. Lord, let us recognize our callings and then do something with that calling so all of us can be busy doing 
doing the work of God. All these things we ask in the name.